Chapter 51 Once Upon a Broken Heart Evangeline had thought Mary's soul had betrayed her before, but she hadn't, not really. Bewitching Luce wasn't betrayal. There had been nothing to betray. Evangeline and Marisol had lived in the same house, but they weren't really sisters. They never shared secrets, they never shared heartaches, and they had never been as honest as they'd been with each other tonight. But Evangeline should not have been so truthful. Marisol, don't do this. Evangeline pleaded. Marisol's only reply was to sink in the ground and hug her knees, making herself look small and vulnerable as the door of her suite flung open. Evangeline frantically searched for an escape, but there was only a balcony. She wouldn't survive a jump, and there wasn't enough time. Two guards, quickly followed by another pair, rushed into the room and a clatter of drawn swords all pointed at her. She just confessed to murdering Prince Apollo, Marisol lied. That's not true. Evangeline was cut off as several soldiers converged, grabbing and restraining and cutting off her words. My heart, my heart, are you all right? Tevis burst through the open doors. He sounded just like his brother when he'd been cursed as he rushed into Marisol's arms and Evangeline felt utterly stupid once again for believing her stepsister had not bewitched him. Marisol might have confessed some things, but clearly she hadn't been honest about everything. She was really behind all of this. Put Evangeline in my chambers, Tavis ordered. Darling, are you sure that's a good idea? Marisol latched onto his arms, doing an excellent expression of a helpless maiden. Shouldn't you take her down to the dungeon, lock her up, where she can't hurt anyone else? Don't worry, my heart. Tavis pressed a kiss to Marisol's forehead. I just need to question her. Then I'll make sure she's put somewhere she can't hurt anyone else ever again. The goddess used little care as they dragged Evangeline to Tavis's chambers and tied her to one of the chairs. After they relieved her of Jack's dagger, her ankles were roughly secured to the legs and her arms were stretched behind her. Her hands were bound at the wrist and then tied again with the rope that went all the way around her midsection, cutting into her ribs and making her uncomfortable to breathe. Tavis didn't spare her a glance as it was done. He didn't acknowledge it, but she repeatedly cried, I swear I didn't kill your brother. Tibris simply stared into a great black stone hearth and ran a hand through his long copper hair, watching as one of his guards started a fire. He no longer looked like the impish rebel prince she met at her wedding. Lines that had not been there before bracketed his mouth, and his eyes were full of red. He didn't appear bewitched right now. He looked as if he were in mourning, which was one good thing. If Tibris was really mourning... If he really loved his brother, as she believed, then he would want to know who the real killer was. All Evangeline had to do was to stay alive, long enough for Tibbers to see the blue bottle of Fortuna's fantastically flavored water, containing the antidote she'd made. It was sitting on the low center table across from her, next to his other bottles of liquor. If he just saw it and drank it, all would be all right in the world. Evangeline would have tried to bring the bottle to his attention, but she imagined mentioning it would only make them all suspicious. She sensed how much each of the soldiers in the room had felt about Prince Apollo from the way they regarded her. Disgust, anger, loathing, there were no hints of pity, although Havelock, his personal guard, who had also been there the night that Apollo had died, looked regretful. He probably felt as if he failed his prince. Tavris continued staring at the fire. He picked up a fireplace iron shaped like trident, placed its tip to burning flames, and watched as it turned red. Evangeline started sweating, skin going slick against her bonds. She didn't know if Tibbers was planning on torturing her with a fire iron or killing her, but she feared either option. Your Highness, Havelock said softly, now that we know Prince Evangeline is in custody, we should delay tomorrow's wedding. The news may... No. Tibbers' voice was slightly unhinged. The soldiers did a good job schooling their expressions, but Evangeline were at least too wide-eyed and she wondered if they suspected something was amiss on the young prince's engagement. I can't handle this from here. Tibbis tore the hard iron from the fire and blew at the tip until it went brighter. You can leave us, all of you. But, Hevlock said again, Your Highness, careful. Tibbis seethed. If you're about to imply that I can't handle one tied-up female, then, I'm going to either be offended or think you're competent of tight knots. The soldier smiled toward the door. Wait, Evangeline begged. Don't go, he's been be bewitched by Marisol. Do not be merch, my love. Tibbers swirled around and brought the fire iron down on the low center table, shattering a one of his liquid bottles. Glass flew like arrows, liquid sizzled, 
Eventually stepped in a gasp as she watched the bottle of Fortuna's fantastically flavored water totter back and forth. It fell on its side. Thankfully, it didn't break. That had been closed. Evangeline would have to be more careful. Mentioning Marisol was clearly out of the question unless she wanted to risk her only chance of surviving. There was also the hope that Jax might make a perfectly timed appearance and come to her rescue once again, but she couldn't rely on that. For all she knew, he was still asleep on his sofa. The soldiers all left the chamber. Chamber stopped closer, boots pounding on the broken glass. He stopped awkwardly and had a tipped over bottle of antidote with scalp. How did this get here? I hate these things. He picked up the bottle with two fingers and brought it towards the fire. No, 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 she wanted to scream. But instead of throwing it in, the bottle worked its magic. Tibra stopped, took another look at the concoction, popped the cork with his mouth and drank. Evangeline felt her hope grow bright. But after only a few seconds, Tibra wrenched the bottle from his lips. He shuddered and gave the drink a foul look. Once I'm king, these drinks will be the first thing I allow. Tibber swayed the fire around in his hands as if deciding now he wanted to do this. Evangeline could only take shadow breaths. She needed to buy more time for the antidote to work. She doubted begging would help, but maybe she could talk without triggering a violent reaction. The last time I saw you, you said that when we met again, you'll tell me why you had disappeared. A bitter laugh, another drink, followed by another wince. I had left after my brother and I thought about you. Tibbet said grimly. I told him you weren't the saber of one claimed. I told him you'd be the death of him. Why would you think that? All that matters is, I was right. The prince pointed the fire and iron directly at Evangeline's throat. No, I didn't do this. She walked to a chair urgently, hoping by some miracle it would fall hard enough to shatter the arms and legs and set her free, but the chair was too heavy. She couldn't even get the seat to budge. I didn't kill your brother. I know, Tibbet said. I've known it. The whole time. Well, what? Evangeline sputtered. He was telling her what she hoped to hear, but the young prince still looked as if he had no intention of letting her go. His freckled face was that of a stubborn soldier with an order he was determined to carry out. I don't understand, she said. If you know I'm innocent, why are you doing this? It's too dangerous to let you live. Tibbet shook his head, expression determined, and yet Evangeline's sense he didn't get any pleasure from this. He took another drag from the antidote bottle and then pulled down the neck of his striped doublet, revealing a dark black tattoo of a broken skeleton key. Do you know what this is? Evangeline shook her head. This is a symbol of the proctorate. The proctorate? She had heard the name before, but where? Her heart quickened as she tried to think, then her heart stopped altogether as she remembered. Apo had told her about the proctorate the night he shared the stories of Valerie Arch. They'd been in the first version of the story, where the Valors had made something horrible. Apollo has said the Proctorate was some sort of secret society responsible for protecting the broken pieces of Valerie Arch and making sure it would never be opened again. Evangeline looked again at Tibbet's broken key tattoo. The Fortuna Matriarch had worn a chain with a similar key around her neck. She must have been a member of the Proctorate as well, and as soon as she suspected that Evangeline was the girl mentioned in the prophecy that kept the Valerie Arch locked, the matrix had tried to kill her. Evangeline's hope crashed and died. Tibbet took another swing from the bottle in his hands. Even if the antidote would concur him of this artificial love for Marisol, Evangeline knew that she was never getting out of the room alive. Not if Tibbet believed she was part of the prophecy that once fulfilled would allow the Valley Arch to open and release the Valley's terrible creation into the world. I'm sorry, Evangeline. Tibbet's voice hardened as his hands gripped the fire iron tied her knuckles turning white. From the look on your face, I'm assuming you know what the proctorate is, so you know what I have to do and why. No, Evangeline said. I don't know how you can kill someone because of a story that's twisted by a curse. Your brother told me there are two different versions, and one, the valley. It doesn't matter which version of the story is true. A muscle popped in his jaw. The valley arch can never be opened, which is why you have to die. I knew it as soon as I saw your hair. You're the prophesied key. You were born to open it. Tibbet left the iron once again, bringing it dangerously close to her skin. Evangeline's breathing hitched. She was running out of chances to talk out of this. Sweat beaded at his brow and dropped onto the broken glass near his boots. But she was looking at the other glass. The almost empty glass bottle in Tibbet's hand. He'd nearly finished the antidote. It didn't seem as if the true serum was breaking Marisol's spell. 
and Avenging wondered if the side effects of her potion were kicking in. Fatigue impaired decision-making and judgment, dizziness, and ability to tell a lie, that urge to reveal any unspoken truths. Tibris was definitely experiencing the inability to tell a lie. Or she doubted he would have told her he didn't believe she was guilty. Maybe she pushed him enough. She could somehow lead him to confess the truth to his soldiers. Or she could finally get him to tell her what the problem for C was. And then maybe she could prove she wasn't the girl in it. Maybe it was just a coincidence that she sounded like this girl. At least tell me what the Valley Arch prophecy says. If you're going to kill me because you think it mentions me, don't I deserve to know the entire thing? Tibbs switched the blue remains of the bottle, appearing torn between drinking, talking, or ending all of these things right now. But her theory about the antidote side effects must have been correct, it appeared. He couldn't stop himself from spilling secrets. After a moment, he began to recite. This arch may only be unlocked with a key that has not yet been found. Conceived in the north and born in the south, you will know this key because she will be crowned in rose gold. She will be both peasant and princess. A few get it wrongly accused, and only her willing blood will open the arch. Evangeline sagged against her bonds. It was so short, and almost every piece of it fit her. She had heard the line about her being crowned in rose gold and being both peasant and princess from the Fortuna Matrix. It hadn't been true at the time, but now it was. She was also a figure of wrongly accused thanks to whoever had killed Apollo. She didn't know where she had been conceived. Her parents had always joked that they found her in a crossity crate. Now she wondered if there was a reason why they had concealed the truth. If they had known about this prophecy, had they seen her rose gold hair and her origin as a sign that it could be true someday? But there was one line of the prophecy that she couldn't ensure never came to pass. She just had to convince Cyrus of this. You just said only my willing blood will open the arch, which means I have to want it to open, and I don't. Doesn't matter. Tibbs gave her a bleak look. Magic things always want to do what they wish they are created to do. But I'm not a magic thing. I'm just a girl with pink hair. I wish that were true. His voice was torn. I don't want to kill you, Evangeline. But that arch must remain locked. The Valors had too much power. They weren't evil, but they did things they never should have done. He finished off the remnants of his dream, and this time he pointed the iron at her heart. Wait! Evangeline cried. Can I have a, a last request? I don't think Apollo would want you to murder me. I'm sorry. I really am. But you're not leaving this room alive. I'm not asking you to spare me. Her voice cracked. If this didn't work, these could be your last words. I'm just asking you to call in your soldiers. Tell them my crimes, and then let one of them kill me. Your brother wouldn't want you to murder his wife. Tibbs frowned. But she couldn't see another bout of indecision ghosting across his face. He sensed this was a bad idea, but his judgment was impaired from the antidote. He was uncertain. Please, it's my last request. Slowly, Tibbs lowered the poker. The soldiers were called back in, but Tibbs didn't waste time with pleasantries. I need you to kill her. He shoved the fire iron into the handle with closest guard, a tall woman with a heavy braid and fury in her eyes. Wait, Evangeline breathed, hoping she hadn't just made a terrible miscalculation. I need to tell them. You need to tell them my crimes first. Evangeline Fox, Tibbs grounded out. You have been sentenced to death for the crime of. His jaw seemed to stick. He opened and closed his mouth several times, but no words came out. You can't say it, can you? She asked. Her antidote might not have worked as exactly as she hoped, but it was working. Additional effects of serum for truth may include the inability to tell a lie. Evangeline could have cried of with joy, although Tibbs looked as if he really wanted to kill her now. What have you done? He glowed at the empty bottle in his hands. Did you poison me? I gave you a truth serum, which is why you can't honestly say that I killed your brother. Ask him. Evangeline begged the female guard with the iron. Ask him who killed Apollo. And this, Tibbs ordered the guard. She, she. The guard had lifted the iron, but she hesitated at the prince stammering. Can't you see? She's fed me some sort of magic, Tibbs growled, sweat beating from his brown. She obviously, but he couldn't call her anything untrue. He keeps breaking off because he can't lie, Evangeline said, and he knows that I'm innocent. I had no reason or desire to kill Apollo. I was a person with nothing to gain and everything to lose, and Tibbs knows that. She, she, she's telling the truth. The prince's face turned red. Evangeline didn't kill my brother. I did. Chapter 52, Once Upon a Broken Heart 
Tibber staggered on his feet. If Evangeline had been standing, she would have undoubtedly lost her footing as well. She expected him to try to take the confession back or grab the iron from the guard and run her through. Wasn't that what a murderer would do? But perhaps it wasn't just the antidote side effects that had torn Tibber's confession free. Instead of fighting back, Tibbers fell to his knees and brought the hands to his face. I didn't mean to kill him. It was supposed to be you. Eyes rimmed in grief and anguish met hers. I didn't want to hurt my brother. I found a poison of Faith's tears that were only supposed to affect females. But it seems the story was a lie. Tears finally streamed down Tibbers' cheeks, long, endless rivers of them. It was almost like, when she cried from Lala's tears only, his heartache was entirely real. Tibbers solved the way that... Only broken things could, and Evangeline couldn't help but start crying with him. She cried once more for Apollo. She cried with relief that she was still alive, and she cried for Tibris. Not for the part of him that had tried to kill her, but for the part of him that had killed his brother in mistake. She didn't know what it was like to have a sibling, and given all that had happened between her and Marisol, she thought that she would ever understand, but Evangeline understood how it felt to lose family, and she could not fail and be responsible for that loss. She didn't know how long they both sat there crying. It could have been half the night, a handful of hours, or minutes. The meal is stretched out to feel like forever. The female guy who had poised to kill her had tied, untied Evangeline right away, but it wasn't until after dawn that several of the other guards escorted Tibbers out to take him to a holding cell. He didn't try to fight them. What's going on? Marisol chose that moment to come out from her room. Tibbers? The defeated prince looked up, his anguish briefly departing, but this time it wasn't replaced with love. If I ever see you again, I will kill you too. It seemed the spell had finally broken. The Evangeline didn't know if it was because of her antidote or if Jax had been right about real love being strong enough to break love spells and it actually was Tybris' love for his brother that had broken through when he had confessed the truth. He turned back to Evangeline. For my last request, I never want to see her face again. No, my love. My soul started to cry, but she kept the performance up, even as Evangeline had soldiers lock her inside of her room until further notice. In October, she didn't want to see her stepsister anymore. Evangeline couldn't blame me everything that had happened to Marisol. Marisol hadn't been the one to poison her or Apollo, but Evangeline did wonder what would have happened if Marisol had not put a spell on loose. Would Faye had interwined in another way to turn Evangeline into the girl in the Valley Arch Prophecy? I would think that worked out differently for her and Luz and Apollo and Tibris. But she destined to end up here? Or was it just one of the many possible paths? She would never know, but she had a feeling this question would always haunt her. It didn't take long for Evangeline to transform from fugitive back into a princess. She was moved into another untamed royal suite with a roaring fire and lots of thick cream carpets that felt wonderful beneath her tired feet. Everyone seemed to want to fuzz over her, exclaim how glad they were that she was safe, and how they all knew that she couldn't have killed Prince Paul. Evangeline wasn't sure if she believed any of them, but she accepted all the fussing. At the urging of servants, she bathed and changed into a much more comfortable gown of white, satin with a striped black underskirt and a blitz decorated with pretty black embroidery. Not a nurse didn't wear full blacks for mourning, but it was customary to at least wear some. Even more guards and servants and half-away palace officials were caught into a suite after that. For hours, it was a flurry of maids bringing Evangeline warm food and officials making requests and suggestions that sounded a lot like orders. Jack's had yet to appear and she tried not to worry too much about it. Maybe he just hadn't come because her name had been cleared. Hours ago, a messenger had said to Christoph Nightlinger the daily rumors so word could get out about Evangeline's innocence. Given how fast gossip spread, the entire kingdom probably knew by now. But she still would have liked to see Jax and told him the news herself. Ever since she proved her innocence, Evangeline had been eager to see Jax's face when she shared that. She confronted Marisol, discovered who the really killed Apollo, and cleared her name on her own. Only now that it was an earring late afternoon, her eagerness had turned into tightness in her chest. Why hadn't Jax shown up at Wolf Hall? He should have sent her a note. Unless he was still asleep, yesterday she'd been amused by the idea of Jax being slayed by slumber, but now it unnerved her. Was it his fatigue? Hadn't it just been a side effect of the vampire venom? I need a coat, she said. One of the many maids in the room stepped closer to the blazing fire. Would you like me to put another log on? No, I need to step out, Evangeline said. She knew no one wanted her to leave Wolf Hall. The Council of Great Houses, which now included Evangeline, was being called to assemble as soon as possible to discuss... What was to be done now that one direct heir was dead and another was in prison? Any minute, and she'd be summoned to meet them. 
but she wasn't sure she could sit and wait any longer. She needed to make a quick trip back to the spires to check on Jax. She knew she shouldn't care so much, but she couldn't stop fearing that something was wrong. Your Highness? I saw her near the door close his throat. There's a gentleman who just arrived, and he's insisting upon seeing you. He... Let him in! Evangeline didn't allow the soldier to finish. It seems she had, him, had been worrying about Jax for nothing. I'm afraid he's not with me. We put him in the receiving solitary. I'll take you to him, your highness. It was Havelock. Evangeline would have rather gone alone, but either Havelock had been the sole guard who hadn't looked at her with peering loathing. He also suggested that Tibbers postpone the wedding to Marisol, which showed bravery as well as good intuition on his part. If she were going to be safe with anyone, it would probably be Havelock. There were more protests as they ventured out the door. The council members are on their way. You can't leave now. You're too tired. You don't want to pass out if you walk all the way. And then there was a lower voice inside her head, speaking only to her. Little fox, where are you? It's about time, she thought. I'm heading to you right now. Don't, Jack's voice turned worried. I'll come to you. Evangeline found herself smiling just a little. She liked that he sounded concerned. Just wait for me, she thought. She was already on her way, and she thought it wasn't very far. Evangeline had only been to the brightly lit receiving um, solitarium once, with a pole. He'd taken her and Marisol on a tour of Wolf Hall when they had first moved into the castle. She had enchanted by the beautiful fortress that Wolfric Valor was rumored to have built as a gift for his wife, Honora. Evangeline had imagined there was a secret passage behind the tapestry and trapdoors, hidden beneath the carpet. But now, with the fatigue clouding her vision, everything was a blur of stones and vaulted ceilings, fireplaces to battle the endless drafts, Scones full of unlit candles, the occasional bust, and the not-so-occasional portrait of Apollo. When she passed one of Apollo and Tibris, with arms around each other's shoulders, she had a pause. Apollo looked so happy and vibrant. It was the same way he often looked at her. She thought his expression had been pure enchantment, but now it was painfully tempting to wonder if things had been realer than she believed. Had she been right to hope that they could have really fallen in love? But she would never know. What would have been was a question that no one ever knew to answer. Evangeline started walking again, following Hivelock into a windowless hall where the tapestries and lit by crude torches that smelled of earth and smoke and secrets. She might have only been at the receiving solitarium once, but this was utterly unfamiliar. Is this the right way? She asked. We have to take a detour, said Hivelock. His face was impassive. The perfect palace soldier. If not for the creeping feeling of a knees crawling over her skin, jolting her back to alertness, Evangeline might have believed him. Did you get lost, little fox? Jack's voice again, but he sounded further away than before. Maybe we should meet me after all, she thought back. Then to have luck. I think I'm going to turn around. That would be a mistake. The lusting voice came from behind her.